are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Jeremy. Hello, Sense hello, of Julia. Beer Style listeners, and welcome to our episode on oatmeal stout, our style cast on a super fun traditional style that you still find enough today where I personally have New Glarus Brewing out of Wisconsin's uh, seasonal called Road Slush as an example. So we still see many different examples of this very historic style being um, produced today and it's still just as exciting and flavorful. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of the relevance and history, and then Jeremy will get us to the good stuff to get us going, which is the characteristic ingredients. And I will say that in studying this style, it has a uh, parallel path to kind of its brother-sister style of oatmeal stout, Um, although they developed kind of on their own their characteristic ingredient that's added beyond the stout part, right? Um, Sweet stout, if you're familiar with that, which is not this style, oatmeal stout is different, uh, but similar. Sweet stout is really differentiated with lactose milk sugar, whereas oatmeal stout, you guessed it, is differentiated because of oatmeal. And oatmeal is definitely an ingredient we'll talk about in this sh- in this style cast that takes um, on uh, and, 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 and lends to the oatmeal stout a lot more than just flavor. And so you've got it originating, you know, around the 1900s, according to the style guidelines, supposedly, which I've never chased down. There was original Scottish version, right? Um, And then you've got some English brewers who are using oatmeal stout to just get them to be able to produce something that is considered healthy. So adding oatmeal supposedly gave it healthful benefits, at least in the marketing sense. Um, And I'll think it's a healthy thing to add some oatmeal to to beers for sure. Uh, And now you've just got this more modern modern adaptation version um, of, uh, of oatmeal stouts that you're seeing. And, and this is, I mean, basically, if you're going to taste this, it's sessionable, definitely on the alcohol level, less than 6%, a darker, richer style stout that is still sessionable, known for some girth of mouth feel, and uh, very enjoyable with food as well. That's the big picture. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to ingredients, it, you know, I'm sorry, it kind of reminds me of, of my father. My, my father was uh, born and raised in Southern England. And, and for the longest time, it, it took us a while to break him of this habit, but he loved his steaks well done, smothered in A1 sauce. He loves his toast burnt. Uh, so if, if he is of any indication of, of a collective uh, palate, the, you know, there, there is a em, em, embracing uh, the the burnt flavors, and, and I know that's a horrible stereotype, but there is a theme there. And I imagine somewhere along the line, someone said, "You know, it, these stouts are great, but what if we added some sweetness to take the edge off?" Uh, and we, we in another style cast, we talk about sweet stouts where they added some milk sugar to kind of take the edge off that. Another way to take the edge off that bitter burnt roasty over roasted flavor that sometimes we get out of these beers is to add oatmeal. And what the great thing about that is, you know, they're, they're using pale malts, they're using caramel malts, they're using these dark roasted malts to get that color, to get that flavor, but they're also using oatmeal or, uh, or malted oats at around five to 20% of the grist of, of the, uh, grain recipe, uh, so that we can get that mouthfeel that we'll talk about in a minute. We can get these flavors that we talk about and just kind of smooth that rough edge around that bitterness. But they are going to use typically, uh, if it's a, you know, we're talking about a British oatmeal stout, they're going to use a British style hops for bittering. Uh, it, it should be in balance. It's a very malt forward style, uh, but you can still get some of those British uh, flavors of, of just earthy and soil and stone they can also actually use some sugars or syrups. That is that is not out of the question. Uh, brewers have a lot of tricks up their sleeves to 
to create a beer, to make it consistent, to fix a beer if it doesn't fall quite in spec. And so these are some of the things that they'll use. And lastly, you know, we're talking yeast. Yeast it should be, have an English ale yeast that uh, can give it just a little bit of that uh, British character as well. These are the typical ingredients of, of a British oatmeal stout. So let's talk about the appearance. Since both you and I have a, uh, an example of this, let's, let's talk about the appearance of it. Awesome. And my example that I'm holding up, if you happen to be watching us, but if you aren't, no, no worries, get your own and you'll know what I'm talking about, what we're <laughs> talking about. Uh, there's a little bit of a red hue from my angle. Uh, you're probably just seeing it darker and more opaque. But traditionally, the appearance obviously is brown to black in color. That's what most stouts will take us to. But I get a little bit of a red hue in this example. And then thick, creamy, persistent, tan to brown collar of foam. Um, the Anytime you have your, your collar of foam with tan to brown, that's going to indicate um, unroasted malted barley has been added. And that definitely lends color to the foam as well as mouthfeel. And then, as I mentioned, um, clear, uh, it's not supposed to be fully opaque, but it you know, doesn't have to be fully brilliant. You're definitely not supposed to see any haze or, or clouds in this, in this oatmeal stout. What are you smelling, Jeremy? So within this aroma, because of all the ingredients, we, we're definitely going to get some roasted grain, some of that dark uh, kind of graininess to it. But I also get this, uh, and, and you can get this impression of, of coffee with cream. And now we're not going to smell sweetness and smelling cream is a different thing entirely, but imagine smelling a latte. And, and so you can get a latte. And so you can have a latte all the way to a cappuccino where the, the proportions are different. And so just imagine that, or if, if, uh, if you've been to France, a cafe au lait, so you kind of get those aromas that, that are reminiscent of that. You can have this low to medium high fruitiness coming through. Uh, a lot of that's from the caramel malt. A lot of that's coming through from the oats as well. Um, and maybe even uh, other different ingredients too, depending on, on the aroma itself. But but you can have a, a strong fruity impression. Uh, with this one, it's hard to put my thumb on exactly what that fruit is, but there is a, a pretty medium uh, fruitiness to it. Uh, you can have a medium low uh, or, or none at all, but you can have a medium low kind of that earthy floral uh, British hop that's reminiscent of soil and stone that we talked about a minute ago. Uh, it doesn't have to be there, but it's typically going to be there with enough balance where the sweetness isn't a runaway train but because this is a very malt forward style. So it doesn't have to be there. Uh, the, you can have a little bit of diacetyl coming through there. This is the, the style the a lot of the British yeast loves to, uh, keep the diacetyl around and, and not work through it, given enough fermentation time. So a little bit of that is okay. And a little bit of that is charming if you ask me. Um, but you know, one of the other things too, that I smell particularly coming from the oatmeal or the, uh, the oats is you can get a little bit, it can't smell like oatmeal, it can't smell like oats. Sometimes I get a little bit of like a grassy nuttiness that comes through because of that ingredient. And so that is completely within the realm of, of, of normalcy as well. But that's what I smell. Let's talk about what we taste. What you just set, got a sense of in the aroma fully falls into the flavor and then add a few things on top of there. So very similar, not a lot of twists and turns from the aroma to flavor. Um, you know, mild roasted coffee, uh, you're going to get essence of chocolate. I, it goes to kind of almost like a chocolate pudding to me, um, but not mm. all the way to Tootsie Roll, not that advanced and mouthwatering, um, but kind of think creamy, chocolatey flavors, right? More milk chocolate than dark chocolate in, in, to me, frankly. Um, and so, Jeremy, when you talk about aroma and I talk about flavor and the style guidelines do, we're covering the characteristics that are influenced in the beverage from the ingredients. So what comes from the malt? It's that that dark roasted malt flavors of coffee and, and, and chocolate and, and the like. What comes from the yeast? It's that low fruitiness that Jeremy talks about, that essence of uh, low esters. What comes from the yeast also sometimes can be yeast byproducts of potentially allowable in the style, uh, low diacetyl, but not aggressive. What also comes from the um, ingredients uh, in the flavor and the aroma is the oats. So in the flavor, I almost get an essence of a little bit of grittiness, and that goes to mouthfeel, but it's part of the flavor. And so that toasty nuttiness the style guidelines talks about, um, 
is super fun. And in the example I'm uh, drinking from New Glarus, they even added Victory Malt, which is a malt, a higher kiln temperature malt that can bring nuttiness to the flavor. So I think working with Victory Malt is really good addition. Yeah. Um, and then you get an essence of the ingredients in the flavor that is bitterness. You wouldn't get the bitterness from the hops in your aroma. Um, so medium bitterness is what you're going to have this style allow for. And I think that balances some of the residual sugar, and it's a perfect amount. It's not too much, too little. So medium bitterness for oatmeal stouts is what you want to remember. And then the finish, it can be dry or sweet depending on the example. So that's kind of that spectrum of where a style can fall, an example can fall within the style guidelines. Um, and then the last is the hops are going to influence the flavor, not just the bitterness. Medium low to those uh, UK kind of earthy floral hops is optional, um, but not as common. And also the less fresh that your beer is, the less you're going to notice that, that hop flavor. Um, and then the last component of our, our flavor and our flavor triangle of things is mouthfeel. What are you getting? Yeah. And with these beers, uh, they can be a, kind of a medium full to a very full body. The, these ha these have a lot of body to them. And a lot of that comes from the, the, you know, adds to the body, adds to the texture is this, is the, is the uh, oil that comes from the oats as well. It can be very smooth, can be silky, can be velvety, can be elegant. Uh, and if you're not paying attention you, that can be perceived and assumed that it's just part of the body of the beer itself, but it's an extra ingredient that just kind of changes the nature of that. And so just be aware when you're tasting these, when you're studying these, try to differentiate between body and texture, because though there's a lot of overlap here, I think. With this, uh, it, it depends if you're having it on cask, it's going to have a lower carbonation, but if it's from a bottle or can, uh, you can expect, a, you know, a medium, uh, carbonation may be a little bit higher. Uh, and it's okay to have, a, you know, none at all, but you can have a little bit of alcohol warming. I'm, I'm getting just a little, just a little hint of warming coming through this as well. And so it just really takes the mindfulness and the meditation aspect of, of tasting your beer and really parsing through those different elements. It, it, this is a fantastic beer to study mouthfeel with. Um, so that being said, I think our next thing on there uh, is, uh, what, what kind of beer does this compare to? I love your reference to intentional, uh, and in, in doing style comparison, mm. you really want to dial into that intentional yeah. grounding of what each style is described as, and then tasting to see where your mind and, and palate, the mind to palate connection can differentiate. I'm going to tell you a quick story where the other night, uh, I was watching succession, crazy show. Um, award-winning and my husband says what's what's it like and I said well it's kind of like a cross between the show office and West Wing and and it's like <laughs> that's what you're doing in these style comparisons for an oatmeal stout and so basically you know it's a cross between an Irish extra stout and a sweet stout with oatmeal added and so that's the good example of things have brother sisters as Jeremy will say in in comparison but you're going to really want to look for that girth in the mouthfeel with the oatmeal for this one. Um, and it's, uh, it's got a, a, a spectrum and uh, many variations that the style guidelines even acknowledge when the style guidelines aren't busy pointing that out for other styles. So it's a broader range that you're going to see these sweet stouts, um, forgive me, these oatmeal stouts be um, given to you by the brewer's interpretation of what the style is. So, um, you know, it's uh, with sweeter versions, more like a sweet stout with oatmeal um, instead of the lactose. The drier versions, more like a nutty, flavorful Irish extra stout. Both tend to emphasize the body and the mouthfeel. So I think that's a really excellent uh, overview of the style comparison. And to me, the vital statistics always help me dial in on at least that spectrum allowable for the ranges within this style. So Jeremy, what are the stats? Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about commercial examples and then I'm going to, since you brought no, it up, well, we can, since you brought it up, I, I'm going to send the vital stats back to you. Yeah, but first, fair, let's fair. talk about I went out of order. I went, we, have a, <laughs> we have a specific order, y'all, because yes. we follow the style guidelines in order of how they overview it. I stand yeah, corrected. But, but you are so intuitive because you, you know, right where you're going, you know, to find this, this is, this is pretty easy. If it says oatmeal stout, grab it, drink it and try it. Chances are you've got the house odds in your favor that that will be a fairly good example of an oatmeal stout. I personally am drinking uh, the oatmeal stout from Mach Machine House Brewery in Washington. 
And uh, I also have the uh, Otis Oatmeal Stout from Nikasi in Oregon uh, that I have that I haven't opened yet, but I will. I promise you, Nikasi. Um, but the the ones that end up on the list in the BJCP guidelines are Anderson Valley Barney Flats Oatmeal Stout. That one that one's classic. It's been there for a while. Another great classic, particularly uh, from England, is the Samuel Smith Oatmeal Stout. That's kind of a standard. Uh, Young's London Stout, a little bit harder to find. Uh, the Broughton uh, Stout Jock, uh, St. Ambrose Oatmeal Stout, and the Summit Oatmeal Stout. These are all on the list, but you're not going to find these just everywhere. Um, so try and find some of the craft versions. Uh, you, if you get a lot of hops coming out of it, it's going to be more an American interpretation of. But if it's balanced toward the malt uh, and the hops are just for balance, chances are it's going to be a fair example of a British style. So without all further ado, uh, Julie, I know you're dying to talk about the stats. Let's talk about the stats. Great. And we do follow the Beer Judge Certification Program style guidelines that does not have the European Brewing Convention or the Plato for styles. So when Jeremy and I neglectfully uh, and unintentionally don't mention that, please just know that's why. Um, or we calculate it before each show and we're, we're on top of it. Uh, today, I'm just following. Yeah, we're, working, we're working hard behind the scenes on this. Yes, and Jeremy, <laughs> you can support me because I don't have the uh, what I just mentioned for um, Oh, I got out. Great. I got him. I'll fill it in. Original gravity, uh, 1045 to 1065. That's a very sessionable uh, indication for a beer. Final gravity, 1010 to 1018. That's going to indicate a broad spectrum of potentially all the way up to 1018 for residual sugar. That's a lot compared to 1010 for final gravity. Um, but the alcohol by volume is going to showcase that sessionable nature that I, I reflect and mention. 4.2% to 5.9%. I personally consider beers under 6% much more sessionable. That's half than most wines, for example, and even more as the wines continue to eke up to 13, 14% ABV for your general um, style examples. And then international bitterness units is 25 to 40. I'm going to again point out that's a broad spectrum. 25 is definitely getting to discernible levels, but 40, I'm going to say, is is bitter um, and, uh, you know, will stand up much more to that residual sugar. And then a standard reference method or SRM is 22 to 40, again, a broader range. So think about that. Um, a lot of 20s that I'm looking at for IBUs and, and SRMs to 40, 22 to four, 25 to 40 for IBUs, SRM 22 to 40. So that's really easy to remember. So that basically means you're in the brown range to black all the way. And so there you have it for vitals. Yeah. And just to fill that in, if, uh, you know, if you are an EBC color person, you know, the SRM is 22 to 40, it, it you know, the, the EBC, um, um, equation is times it by 1.97, I think it is. So let's just say it's double. So the EBC is going to be 44 to 80. It, it's dark. It, it's, it's like, you know, medium brown to black, uh, at, at the lightest. Uh, so the, with the gravities, if you're a degrees Plato type of person, we're talking, uh, uh, 11, three to 16, three low, low levels of 16s, uh, for the original gravity, the final, uh, the final gravity or final Plato, I should say is two and a half to four and a half. What that's going to put it at is for your, your degrees Plato for the, the strength of it is going to be in the upper eights, uh, to the upper 11s, um, and so if for those of you who are degrees Plato people, then that will make a lot more sense. Uh, but you know, that that's that, but let's, let's talk about, uh, we can both talk about this since we both have this, uh, the, the type of glassware and the temperature that we expect to have these in. So Julie, I, I noticed that you, uh, you don't have, uh, the, the, the picture perfect glass, but what I love about that is really the only thing that matters is getting this glorious liquid to our lips. That's really all that matters. The glassware just has to do with logistics, aesthetics, practical, you know, practical logistics, aesthetics, and preference. Uh, and there's a little bit of tradition along there as well. I'm drinking this beer out of a Nonuk pint. It's a regular shaker pint with a little bulge toward the top uh, that has, you know, th that that's a typical one. It helps keep things from getting scratched when you stack these up. It, it the, the glass holds onto my hand. Well, my hand holds onto the glass, so it's very symbiotic. Another great glass that I love to drink these beers out of, let me, oh, it's here somewhere, is I love my dimpled pub mug. This is such a great 
glass to drink these beers out of. It, it encourages drinking, which, you know, if you're drinking, then, you know, we don't need any more encouragement, but this glass does a good job of it. Another great glass that you expect to see would be a tulip pint. And it's very similar to what you uh, see uh, Guinness served in. It's a very, it's a pint glass, but it's a little bit more voluptuous, got some more curves to it. And it's just a, a it's just a fun glass to drink. And it has some uh, benefits of propping up the foam and just doing a great job of delivering that liquid to your lips. And that's really what it comes down to. Temperature wise, my rule of thumb is the darker and stronger, the warmer I want it to be between the the 40 to 50 degree range or the uh, 4 to 10 degree uh, range Celsius. Uh, this one, I'd like to see toward the upper end of that spectrum. I'd love to see this, you know, 45, even up to 50. And, and you know, in some some circumstances, I could see this getting uh, beyond 50 degrees just a little bit because this really opens up, has just this wonderful flavor expression, and it can take a little bit of cellar temp, if you will, to really open up and just enjoy this beer. Yeah, so up to 10 Celsius or, or even further and a great opportunity to try it warmer um, and also try it cold and ready out of the fridge. Yeah, absolutely. But more importantly, Julia, what would you eat with this? So the easy, easy thing that's on my mind is obviously oatmeal cookies, right? You've got so <laughs> much essence of these cookies that have been baked and exposed to higher temperatures, but not burnt or acrid, that this beer style, especially with its little ode and essence of oatmeal in the uh, mouthfeel and a little bit of flavor, frankly, and grittiness, oatmeal cookies all the way, baby. And then maybe put some vanilla ice cream in between those oatmeal cookies. And now I have an oatmeal cookie um, ice cream sandwich. Uh, I could, I could really just go for that. Like right now. Yeah. I mean, sure. It's not your entree and your main course, which this would go great with. This would go great with aged steak, right? It's not going to get, um, barreled over. It's not going to bring soy sauce or any essence of, of that to the equation, but aged steak and then grilled and charred is going to find links, bridges, and hooks to our higher roasted um, uh, kiln malts uh, and, and higher temperature roasted malts. And some of that nuttiness, frankly, from the flavor and the chocolate and that essence of, of light roasted coffee is going to do so well. I mean, you go to some steakhouses and they'll literally dust the, the steak with a little bit of coffee grinds even. So I love yeah, the essence absolutely. of that and, and, and go for it. You know, and you made me think about like uh, getting those oatmeal raisin cookies from Costco, for example. Those, for me, tend to be a little too sweet. I can eat one and then I'm done. I need a beer like this to make to make that work because that will help kind of bring out what bitterness is in this beer and just make everything work perfectly. I think uh, you know, dessert aside, because I'd love I'd love to do some thorough research on some German chocolate cake with this beer as well. Oh, yeah. I think that would be an in, I think that would be an interesting. Uh, Thing. Maybe even some uh, upside down pineapple cake that, you know, I, I'm willing to do the sacrifice to see if that actually works or not. But from a dinner standpoint, I, I would love to have this beer because it's not overly sweet. There is a little bit of balance in there. I'd love to try this with a steak, some, you know, some fajitas, maybe some enchiladas that aren't too spicy. Uh, you know, maybe some, um, some uh, chili verde uh, cheese enchiladas that would, or, or even like a frittata, a frittata for brunch would be fantastic with this. I think that would be uh, just a great way to bridge these flavors, to contrast these flavors and find harmony with everything in there. Yep. Yeah, you're on a roll. I'm hungry. That's why. Right. <laughs> totally. Well, thanks for listening but to us. So you want an outro, Jeremy? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, I, 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 you know, we've been starting to get some uh, comments coming through on our YouTube channel, and they're fantastic. We'd love to hear that. Uh, we're getting some reviews on the podcast, and thank you for everyone who's been listening. This is this has just been an incredible journey, and I love that everyone's engaging and in finding some value in this. So please, uh, you know, reach out, uh, give a review, uh, leave a comment on YouTube, and let us know what what your favorite pairings are. Other than that, I say cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Essential Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. 
Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.